Okay, this is um, <clears throat> Food and Mood, part three, this video. So it's part three of three parts. So we're gonna start out here talking a little bit about treatment things. We're gonna, I'm gonna introduce you to uh, Kelly Brogan, who is a very sort of interesting psychiatrist. Uh, first of all, what improves mood? Exercise is one of the best things you could do to improve your mood. It increases brain-derived neurotropic growth factor. It helps the brain cells to be able to store more glycogen. Um, they don't store much, but at least they store some. And it increases mitochondrial biogenesis in brain cells. I mean, that's as good as it gets. It increases your self-esteem. Every week when I get my squat routine, I'm happy. Like for the whole week, physically, I'm happy. Um, sunshine improves mood. That's one of the best things you could do. Get out in the real sunshine. Use the real sunshine to get your vitamin D rather than pills. And you get more of the activated form of vitamin D, you know, calcium triol, 125 hydroxy vitamin D. Um, eat the optimal diet. We talked about that a million times. Low fat, low sodium, 100% plant based, 100% organic, um, low in estrogens. I don't like all these estrogen foods. You don't need that. Um, and avoid all the toxins. We talked about that in previous lectures. Social support is important. Try to at least get along well with one person in your family, if not more of them. Um, try to maintain your friends through your life. There's a guy by the name of George Valiant. He was a Harvard uh, psychiatrist in charge of some lifetime longitudinal studies. And what he felt, you know, in, in addition to avoiding alcohol and tobacco, maintaining at least one good friendship through your entire life. Could be with a family member and having decent social skills, just trying to get along with people were some of the most important indicators of whether or not a person would have a long, healthy life. Um, and as a person gets older, it's even more important than their cholesterol level. Okay, religion, you know, like I said, it's good to have friends. Religion can be a good friend to you. It can be helpful to you. I've seen a lot of people that's an important thing in their life. I saw my mom when she had her cancer. They thought she'd only live two years. She was pretty religious. She did all this stuff. It seemed to help her. I'm the one who screwed up. I was young. That was more than 20 years ago. I didn't know any better. I didn't know that much about religion then. I thought I did, but I didn't. Um, it's one of my big regrets in life. Sense of autonomy, because uh, I think if I knew more about religion and the metabolic theory of cancer, I could have probably kept her alive longer, because those are the patients who I've seen live the longest, the ones who went low-fat vegan. Look at Ruth Heidrich, PhD, for example. Um, Janet Marie Murray Wakelin, for example, you know, the raw, raw diet person. Okay, anyways, um, sense of purpose in life. I think sense of purpose in life is a little bit like the gating theory of pain. Uh, gating theory means that like if someone has a TENS unit or a back rub or something, the overwhelming stimulation from that makes the minor stimulation through the non-myelinated pain fibers almost irrelevant. So what am I saying here? It makes you more resilient. If you're focused on some important activity, whatever that might be in your life, it helps you protect you from some of the minor pains of life to the extent that that can be done. Uh, like if you're focused on, you know, helping your child, for example, in life or focused on helping some other person, um, it helps you to endure the sadness and disappointments that you'll go through inevitably in your own life. And sometimes that also is physical pain, like from arthritis or things like that. Um, here's a quote from Thomas Shaz, the psychiatrist, MD. We talked about him in a previous lecture. He said, uh, Young and Adler were an improvement on Freud, but they did not go far enough. The key is meaning. Meaning is what sets people free. And I've heard other people say things along those lines. Nietzsche has a quote like that. Dostoevsky has a quote like that. Viktor Frankl has a quote like that. And it's true. Yeah, if you have to have a purposeful life, um, and I like uh, Schopenhauer had a good quote too. He said, forget about a happy life. Try to have a heroic life meaning that if you pursue some goal in a good fashion, good things will come from that. And when you get busy, you shift into the task-based network of your brain, especially along the convexities, that pulls you into the present versus if you're just always avoiding doing the things you really want to do, you sit there and you perseverate back and forth in the default mode network of your brain, the midline off the single the gyrus and whatnot, and the precuneus saying, oh, I wish I'd done this. What about tomorrow? I wish I'd done this yesterday. And that doesn't really get you anywhere. Okay. Um, oh, Shaz said something else rather interesting. He said that it used to be recommended by Freud to treat 
a woman for marital frigidity with electric shock. That's interesting. Interesting thought. Okay, anyways. Um, all right, Kelly Brogan. I'll introduce you to her. She was, she, she is, she's still practicing. She's actually kind of young. She's this beautiful Irish-Italian lady psychiatrist. She's pretty smart. She did her undergraduate at MIT in neuroscience. And now there's an old joke, anonymous statement that says that psychiatry is the only field where the doctor is usually sicker than the patient. So I'm just kidding around, but Brogan, she's smart. And I, I do like a lot of things about her, but she's also kind of crazy. At her website, there's videos of her pole dancing. And she's actually very pretty too. So it's kind of a little bit unusual to see a beautiful lady doctor pole dancing. Um, and I don't agree with her diet recommendations. I'll let you know that. You figured that out and you saw them immediately. But why mention her at all? Because she's pretty smart and she knows a lot about mood disorders. And she has some interesting statements. She wrote a book called The Mind of Your Own, uh, copyrighted in 2016. And she writes that the gut is the body's center of gravity and that diet, lifestyle, and toxins are major causes of food disorders. She says that medicalization of distress obliterates meaning. And I think she's got a good point there. A person who comes in and they're sad about something in their life, they're not just depressed. They're a person who has a problem and they're sad about something. So that's kind of an important thing. Don't just say, depression, take this pill, get out of my office. No, you got to talk to the person. Let the person talk. Probably letting them talk is more important. A lot of people, they don't have that many intelligent friends, anybody they could really have a deep conversation with, and they need time to talk and work out what's bothering them, and sometimes that's all they need. You know, They might need a lot more than that, but sometimes that's all they need. And here's what uh, Dr. Brogan says. She says, before I stopped prescribing, I never once cured a patient. Now people are cured every week in my practice. Now that's an extraordinary statement. She claims that she never cured a single patient by prescribing a medication for a mood disorder, but that she now cures some every week without the prescription. So that's a big statement coming from a psychiatrist. And in, in a way that kind of reminds me of what we've heard before about diabetes and coronary artery disease. You know, you don't cure coronary artery disease with a stent. You just transiently save a patient from an acute myocardial infarction. But their all-cause mortality is not changed unless they change the diet. Diet will actually cure atherosclerosis. It'll halt its progression, and it'll even reverse it partially if they follow it closely. Low-fat vegan diet. Esselstyn's proven that. Pritikin has shown that. Kempner has shown that. And others. McDougall has shown that. Blankenhorn has shown that. Um, Dean Ornish has shown that. Um... So here she is, and then they've shown it with diabetes. You know, Robert Taylor, MD, has shown that. Uh, Shulman has produced convincing evidence of that as well, and others. Okay, um, so it's a rather extraordinary statement. Um, so here we're talking about depression, we're talking about coronary artery disease, we're talking about diabetes. Okay, and why? Because those other diseases are definitely dietary. Um, depression. Depression is definitely multifactorial. It's more complicated. But the fact that diet, diet can help in a big way, and of course you add to that sunshine, exercise, social support, social conversations, a purposeful life, and whatever else, maybe religion, depending if that's your interest or not. There's a lot you could do. Uh, Brogan writes, um, depression is often an inflammation-driven condition and not a neurochemical deficiency disease. Uh, she felt that diet, lifestyle, exercise, sleep, social support were the best approach to mood disorders most of the time. It depends. There's also some more severe disorders that are it's more difficult to help the patient when they're more severely uh, have a problem. Brogan says there's not one study that shows in, a long, in the long term that the patients benefit from treatment with antidepressants for any psychiatric disease. Now, other people would say, well, they really help a lot in the acute uh, setting for some patients. And there's some patients that really have intense acute problems. And so, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not an expert on that. I don't want to go there, but I can just say that that's what she says. She is a psychiatrist. Um, she believes that leaky gut and, infl and inflammation are major contributors to depression. She says that neurotransmitter imbalance, the neurotransmitter imbalance theory of depression, the monoamine theory, in her opinion, is bogus. 
based on, in her opinion, having studied it extensively. Um, and she claims that no one can measure neurotransmitters in the human brain and that the antidepressants overall are no better than placebo and potentially worse. Can have a lot of side effects. That's her opinion. She discusses that on multiple pages in her book. Um, she emphasizes thyroid disorders. And by the way, I can read a person's book and disagree with lots of it, but still think it was well worth reading because a person can have good knowledge and good information and insights about a few things like on psychiatric disease and you don't have to agree with everything they write and you know somebody who's kind of controversial and who has strong opinions is more likely to say something interesting than the typical you know Mickey Mouse conformist book where there's no new information she also had a thyroid problem herself and talked about how thyroid disorders can impair mood and can affect cognitive function, and she actually was able to cure herself by changing her diet and lifestyle, apparently, for her Hashimoto's. And so she has some of the standard things we've recommended in the past for minimizing the risk of uh, leaky gut, for example, and cognitive impairment. Okay, attention deficit. Now, this is sort of, you know, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Um, usually treated, or quite often treated with stimulants like methylphenidate. Um, it'll, and that'll block reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine, so one of these reuptake inhibitors. And I really wonder long term if that's good for the neuron. That's a big deal of a thing to do to a neuron. Uh, this physician, Dr. Ben Feingold, I think he's a pediatrician. He wrote a very famous book, Why Your Child Is Hyperactive. And Feingold recommended you know, avoiding artificial food dyes, artificial flavors, and preservatives. It's called the Feingold Diet. And some people have been helped by that. Um, sad diets associated with increased risk of ADHD. Other people have said, what about allergies and recommend avoiding dairy, soy, eggs, corn, and wheat. Stephanie Seneth, PhD researcher, she claims that the herbicide GP, she thinks, might contribute to this and some other uh, cognitive psychological uh, type disorders. Um, she's got online videos, I know, for people interested in that. Schizophrenia, you know, that's a relatively complex, you know, quite often severe uh, psychiatric condition. I read an interesting book called Soteria, claiming that if they could keep the patients living in an apartment setting with help, they'd often eventually progress and improve significantly. You know, again, I don't know that much about it, but it's pretty interesting. Some people claim it uh, can be related and due to food allergies sometimes, probably multifactorial as well. Um, exercise and increasing BDNF, et cetera, can help schizophrenics potentially. Dietary sometimes helps them potentially a significant amount. Okay, then here's just references if you're interested on some of the stuff we talked about, all this stuff about dietary fat causing blood-brain barrier disruption, thus potentially impairing cognitive function and mood. Uh, all this stuff about insulin resistance leading to inability of your hippocampal neurons, substantia nigra neurons, and some cortical neurons to get enough blood glucose. Um, and let's see, I think there's maybe one more page of references here. Yeah, so if anybody's interested, this is more stuff about metabolic issues, impairing cognitive function and mood. So anyways, that's it for the three lectures on um, food and mood. I uh, hope that was helpful.